Frieden? Hello, everyone. We are so excited to see you all, or not see you as it were, but <laughs> welcome to the webinar. We're going to give just a few minutes for people to join the webinar and get settled. I hope everyone came out of the storms last night okay. They seem to sort of split right over my house, which was super weird. Right. So as people are filtering in, we're going to go ahead and get started. Hi, my name is Grace McClure Topete. I'm the Director of Leadership Programs here at Social Venture Partners Dallas. We are so excited that you're joining us for office hours. Uh, this time is an open time uh, for questions. So you'll notice at the bottom of your screen, you have an option for Q&A. Please feel free to add questions into the Q&A uh, whenever you like to. We'll be keeping an eye on them um, and asking them as we go. We do have a few questions that uh, we're sending ahead of time that we'll be starting with to get our conversation started and maybe they'll inspire some more questions for you as we go. Uh, this session is being recorded, but of course only the panelists are being recorded um, so we'll send the recording out afterwards, after it's ready to everyone who uh, it has attended, in case you want to go back and rewatch it or share it with colleagues. Um, we hope to have some really valuable nuggets of wisdom for you here about program evaluation. So I am very delighted to introduce our panel today. Uh, Nadine DeChosi with the Communities Foundation of Texas is the Senior Director of Learning and Insights. Nadine has been with us at um, nonprofit Impact Institute events before, and we're so excited for her to return. Ashwina Kerpalani Bazanji is the Vice President of Insights and Analytics at Scribe Together, which is focused on bringing community organizations together to increase um, equity, equitable outcomes for children. Ashwina, we're so delighted for you to join us uh, and lend your expertise. Sammy Smith is a customer success engineer with Upmetrics, uh, which helps organizations think about measurement and how they uh, make impact in the world. Sammy, thank you for being with us today. And finally, Dr. Annie Wright, who's the Director of the Center on Research and Evaluation Core at the SMU Simmons School of Education and Human Development, um, where I am an alumni, actually. So Dr. Wright, we're so glad for you to join us. Um, we have uh, some questions for each of you, actually, so I'm excited to dig into those. So I'm gonna start with Dr. Wright actually with our first question. Um, so one thing that organizations uh, ask, not just for this session, but frequently, is that um, they feel like they have a really strong mission and that their programs are really popular and doing well, but they struggle to think about how to measure their impact, how to measure and what to measure in regards to their programs. So where, where should they start? You gave me the toughest question. There's so many, <laughs> so many ways this can go, but I think focusing on the steps makes sense. It can feel overwhelming to try to start measuring. Um, and it can feel very personal because the mission and the programs that we know so many organizations are involved in, they're they're very passionate about. There's lots of um, personal investment and care in, in what those outcomes are. I would say from that perspective, it makes good sense to start with the end in mind. If you know what the mission is and you know what changes you really want to make, you stay focused on that and then you work backwards. Um, we will talk about logic models and theories of change and measurement maps. Um, we talk about results chains. How did you get from this program to this outcome? But really all that means is keeping the end in mind and working backwards to um, really understand in a measurable way, what are the key activities that we are providing? Who are we providing them to? 
and what are the initial changes that we think uh, might be happening. Um, really just starting with that clear articulation of the key components. Sometimes we say this, what are the, what are the key ingredients in your recipe? Uh, and being really clear about who those those program activities are being provided to, that's an important first step. Yeah, I really love that. Just you know, simplifying, starting with your mission, really looking at the big picture and those really starting with the really basic elements, um, and then building up from there in an evaluation program. That's fabulous. Uh, Ashwina, I have a question for you next. So as we're thinking about these, um, you know, who are we serving? What really are the building blocks? We serve a lot of organizations that work with children. And we got a question around children specifically, uh, children in education. So um, some programs, particularly like out of school programs um, that supplement education generally, which hopefully all children are getting, um, struggle a little bit to think about how do we measure our impact versus what those children would go through in school? Um, you know, what's the benefit of school versus um, versus our program. So how do you distinguish when there's other perhaps um, contributing factors in the lives of your, your served clientele? Hi, everyone. It's really good to be with you. Um, that's a really hard thing to do, right? I think that there are um, studies that have tried to like really get at um, the impact of out-of-school time or or certain programs and, and and pieces like that, um, and getting to causation is um, in my in my mind almost I wouldn't say impossible, but really really difficult because it's difficult to extract and control for all the variables in a child's life at home, outside of home, in the neighborhood, at school, with what's going on with the teachers, what's going on with the curriculum, what's going on in the out of school time space. Like there there are so many factors that can influence. Um, a child's outcome or success. Um, and, and I would say, uh, and I haven't done this type of research before, but I think others on the call have, so would love for them to chime in as well. I would say um, what we try to do is like use control groups, right? So it's essentially try to isolate as much as we possibly can with similar spaces. So if it's an out of school time program, supporting a hundred kids in a particular school, you know, look at those 100 children versus the other 200 children that may be in that school and really try to understand the differences taking place with these 100 students versus the 200. So try to isolate um, from the perspective or control by location or by a variable that is incredibly important. Um, maybe it's demographics, maybe it's location, maybe it's um, some other variable that could be really helpful time of year, et cetera. Um, but it's it's it will rarely be causation. It will most likely be correlation. And in the education space, because of all the variables I mentioned earlier, causation um, is is uh, is 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 a very far <laughs> is is a dream at at, at times. For sure, yeah. It it really can be hard to know what contributing factors are are. Um, involved when you're measuring your impacts, but it sounds like, you know, looking at the data that's available, um, particularly in regards to the children, there's tons of data out there and, and just be controlling what you can and comparing where you can is a good place to get started. Thank you so much for that. I'm going to switch tacks a little bit. I have a question um, for Nadine. So this is from the perspective of a funder. Um, this person asked, what are funders looking for in evaluation plans, A, and then the uh, part B, what if our results aren't what we had hoped? How do we talk to funders about that? So uh, <clears throat> two good questions. And um, uh, the the first one, um, so, it, so, you know, what funders are looking for fundamentally is that you are doing evaluation. Um, you know, evaluation is, in our view, really foundational to running an excellent nonprofit organization. And, you know, what we want to see is that every nonprofit, whatever the size, is really embracing the idea of, you know, learning 
and being a learning organization, being really, really curious about how, how, you know, things are going now relative to where you want to go as an organization and like, what's the gap between those two things, the current reality versus um, the goals that you're setting for yourself. So, uh, you know, what we are seeking is just that, that manner of thinking and that the organization is continuously growing their own skills to conduct evaluation or really to do the monitoring that is associated with what Annie was talking about, which is this logic model framework, you know, that connects your activities to, you know, short-term, medium-term and longer-term um, outcomes. Um, I think the second question was, what if those the evaluation shows negative results? Is that what it was? Grace? I'm sorry, say that, say that one more time. What was the second part of that question? Was it? Yeah. How, um, so if our results aren't what we had hoped that they would yeah. be after, after measuring uh, the impact of a program, how do we talk to the funder about that? Okay. So uh, the, I want to just clarify or, or reassure everyone that usually the results are not what, every, what you had hoped for right? That is the norm. So uh, I was actually just recently uh, looking at some research on this that showed that 75% of evaluations show mixed or negative results, um, evaluations of social programs. So we should almost be anticipating that our evaluation is going to show that some things are going well and as we expect, and other things are not. So, you know, again, we have to embrace evaluation as just part of being a learning organization that's committed to improvement and not be shocked when the results come in. The, the funders also should understand this. If you're dealing with sophisticated funders, we have been there. We have seen the 75% the of evaluations that show that um, the results are not all peachy uh, keen or, you know, whatever. Um, and so we are, we are trying to partner with the uh, organizations that are doing evaluation to think about, well, what have you learned from this experience? So, you know, um, I encourage people to be very open, to be very honest and to go pretty, you know, directly to the funder with what you've learned. Um, we recently, again, had this experience in our organization where a university partner who had received a grant to do an evaluation of culinary medicine as an alternative to the, you know, standard of care, which is kind of more of a, a lecture about the, the risks of diabetes. We They had, you know, um, launched this study and found that uh, nobody showed up for culinary medicine. So, I mean, this is a a dramatic negative result where we literally couldn't even um, conduct the, the evaluation because there was no participation in that uh, part of the, uh, in that um, treatment group. And so that's, that, that, you know, that could be seen as a huge failure. You know, we could have been very upset about it, but in fact, we were like, that's incredibly interesting. So why didn't this appeal to the community that we were trying to serve with this alternative, which, you know, some might say is kind of an, a better um, option than the, the current standard of care. Uh, let's do more research. And we encourage them to go and talk to the people who didn't show up for culinary medicine and get some data about, you know, did they not have the, the food? Did they not have the, was the time wrong? Did they not have the interest? Was this a culturally responsive um, uh, approach where they, you know, felt like they were going to get foods or recipes that would be, um, uh, you know, appealing to their family. So you can learn a lot from these negative results that can inform your own, own organization. And I would say in the best scenario, the field. So I would not invite, like I would encourage nonprofits who have disappointing results to talk about it. Um, you know, go to conferences, tell your funder, tell other funders so that we can figure out as an or as a sector where to invest more in learning so that we can, um, you know, crack the nut on some of these uh, pervasive issues. Wow, that is so great, Nadine. And I, you know, what I'm hearing is that, A, it's important to have um, appropriate expectations 
Um, and I think, you know, probably all the nonprofits on this call know that the work that we do is hard. It is really hard um, to have impact in the ways that we want to in our community. And, and you know, that's why we're committed to it. But um, when we're measuring that, having that curious sort of growth mindset um, so that we, you know, we don't just stop when results aren't what we want, uh, but instead use that as an opportunity to learn more about the community and what the community needs and how we can better address those things sounds really important. And also it sounds like having a really open relationship with funders and having those conversations early about expectations and what their expectations are and what, what their experience is in that scenario as well. Sounds like it would be really helpful. Is that, is that fair? Well said, exactly. <laughs> Don't treat your funder as a bank, treat them as a partner. Right. Oh, I love that. Can you say that again? <laughs> Don't treat your funder as a bank. Okay. They are your partner in impact because the, the funder can't be successful in achieving their social mission if, if the nonprofits are not successful. Yeah. It's, you know, we say all the time here at SVP that it's all about the relationship. It's all mm -hmm. about the relationship. Thank you so much, Nadine. I have a question for Sammy up next. Sammy, um, this question is for you specifically. With your experience in nonprofits and now supporting impact organizations with uh, their measurement, what are some common themes that you see and perhaps some uh, common struggles in the area of measurement and evaluation that you see across nonprofits? Yeah, I appreciate the question. So I think back to, to Dr. Wright's point is start, keep it for lack of a better acronym here, keep it simple, you know, the end of the acronym, um, you know, and it's not, to, I think a common thing that happens is we want to overcomplicate how we're looking at data and how we're looking at metrics that we're ingesting. Um, so from, from a technology perspective where I'm working at it, Upmetrics, we kind of took, you know, this, some, the, the kind of overcomplication and said, how can we help um, impact producers uh, tackle this. There's, there's kind of a gap in the market here. And so we looked at, at to Dr. Wright's point, creating, how do we help create a framework tool that is very, very, you know, basic and kind of looks at exactly those points she was making. Who are we serving? What are we doing to serve those individuals? How are we doing it? And to like, what type of quality are we providing? Or, you know, how are the individuals we're serving better off? Um, and so, we create. We actually created a tool, um, the free tool to to help nonprofits um, think through that and kind of have at least that basis of a framework to start to think about what is that end goal, what is our theory of change, what is our impact um, framework, and so that's one thing I think is just having a tool that you can go and use as a resource that sort of gives you some gives you a skeleton right to work with. Um, as far as some of the struggles that I think I've seen, one of them is measuring just for the sake of measuring and not being really intentional about what it is you're, you're gathering information on. Um, it's great to count how many backpacks were collected and distributed, but if I'm not being intentional about what those, what was, what did those backpacks do? Why was I, why was I collecting them? And how are my participants better off from receiving those backpacks? Does that really, does that information really matter? So I think being intentional in how you look at your framework and what the metrics are you're looking to collect is really important. And then also back to Nadine's point, actually using that data to make decisions. And sometimes that means making hard decisions like, realizing a program isn't being effective and what do you do from there? How do you learn from that? And it, so I think that those are two really big struggles that can be really intimidating, especially to small nonprofits of, oh, well, this program that we thought was being really impactful maybe isn't as impactful as we thought it was. How do we course correct from there? Um, and so that's, those are some of the things I think that I've seen both sitting in a, a boots on the ground uh, role of, from nonprofit and now transitioning into to helping organizations think more intentionally about how they're measuring uh, their impact and, and using their data. That's a great point, Sammy. And I, I think I'm going to um, switch my order of questions just a little bit and jump off that to ask um, Ashwina to comment on, um, you know, Strive Together does some collective impact and, and bringing different entities together 
And some of the questions we got were around, you know, when we're deciding what to measure, um, is it better to use sort of the metrics that everybody else is using uh, and, you know, be compared to them? Or is it better to use yeah, the outputs and outcomes that we have decided for ourselves? Like, how do, how do we decide where to land in that spectrum? Yeah, that's a great, great question. And um, I'll probably not fully answer, but we'll throw in some considerations because I feel like most of the time the answer is it kind of depends, right? Um, so one is around really thinking about the program and what the, the, the vision and mission of the program is to understand what the work, um, the influence of the work and the influence of the program. So if a particular program says my internet is unstable, so I'm gonna go off camera just to make sure I don't lose y'all. Um, so if a program, for example, is really about influencing um, early grades learning, then a great indicator to use would be for early grades learning or if a, um, program is, and I think I saw some some notes in here around prevent, uh, preventative and, and, and proactive sexual education, then there, there's a particular output that or outcome that, that you're looking for and identifying what that particular outcome is, is, is really critical. Um, with respect to aligning with other organizations, if there is a broader movement and you and an organization would like to be part of a movement, then I would probably recommend to align with the indicators and outcomes that that particular movement is having so that you too can benefit from the research and benefit from resources and benefit from um, a, the, the, the resources a, a, a network or a community could provide if you are in alignment. So, so I think it really depends on the mission and vision of the organization and, and the change that the organization wants to make in, in the world. Yeah. Those, uh, those it depends answers can be really difficult, but that was really helpful, Ashwina, in thinking about, you know, what what is the larger context of our work and who, you know, none of our work is done in isolation. And so who are our partners, who else is in this space um, and aligning with, you know, what other data is out there sounds um, okay. is really helpful. Thank you so much. Yeah, and, and like a specific example with it for, for partnerships that are part of Strive Together, for example, we're a network of over 70 partners across the country, and we, we measure seven outcome areas. And these particular outcome areas are standard across all organizations that are part of this network. And so we ask every organization to make sure they're collecting these seven outcome areas. And this year, we're being a little bit more prescriptive as to what the definition of that particular outcome area is and with hopes that we can actually start seeing what this movement is able to accomplish. So, so when I say like being part of a network or part of movement, it's really important to align with, with that network or movement. We also give a lot of space for partnerships to move outside of these seven outcome areas. So some partnerships may collect, you know, outside of the seven cradle to career indicators, they may collect things on um, birth weights, or they may collect things on, you know, information around doulas, or they may collect information on unemployment rates, or they, you know, it, we, we, or systems indicators as we describe them. So what is the health of, um, uh, a particular community, it might be housing or infrastructure, et cetera, what, whatever might be influencing a child's ability to achieve their highest potential. Um, and, and so that is really kind of the, the frame that I use. So it's great to be part of a network and have indicators that align or outcomes uh, in outputs that align with other partner organizations. Mm -hmm. And it's also really important to be able to tell your own story if there is something different or something specific that a partnership is or a, a, uh, an organization is, is really trying to influence. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense that it, you know, it helps to have the things that connect you to the to other organizations and also the things that make you unique, perhaps. Um, and be, you know, it's, it's okay to measure those alongside each other uh, and to, to have the full context of the data that way. Thank you so much, Ashwina. Um, so I want to draw attention to the chat. Um, Annie had contributed a, a comment earlier that I think 
um, makes a lot of sense here, which is that um, consider contributions. Uh, so this is in the discussion of out of school time and uh, measuring around children specifically in education. Uh, their contributions to the educational ecosystem, things like increased attendance at school are really meaningful. And I think, you know, not just uh, when we're measuring around children, but for all kinds of different um, social impact programs, that there's often a lot of research around these issue areas out there. And so knowing what is in the research, um, what people are talking about, what, um, you know, the, the uh, broader study of that issue says about, well, we know that attendance is really important. We know that these other indicators, um, you know, are relevant over, over the last several decades. And then thinking about the way that you measure data compared to those things that are sort of standard for your issue area or your industry. Um, can be really helpful in contextualizing the data that you collect. So thank you both so much for that. Um, that does actually bring me to a question for Dr. Wright. Um, so we're talking about outputs and outcomes. Um, and for an organization just starting out in impact and measurement, sometimes you know there's all this evaluation jargon that goes around. Can you explain a little bit the difference between outputs and outcomes? Yes, happy to. Um, think about outputs as counts. Typically in our field, we're providing services to individuals, to children, youth, adults. So we are counting heads. How many different people did your program reach? Outputs tell us that your activities were delivered to this number of people. Outcomes tell us something about how those people changed. Mm -hmm. An outcome is some kind of change statement. It tells us whether the activity that you delivered uh, had some kind of desired effect or to Nadine's earlier point, or did not. Equally interesting, uh, but it is, it is a metric of change. Mm -hmm. Outputs tell you that the program was delivered outcomes tell you whether something changed due to participation in the program. Thank you so much, Dr. Wright. Uh, that is, when I was first learning, you know, all these, all the different jargon and evaluation space, that one always tripped me up. And I know that it's a common question that we get from nonprofits. So I appreciate you clarifying for us. Um, Nadine, I have a question for you based on that. So when we're talking about outputs and outcomes, um, and whether our program has impact in the way we want it or not. Um, somebody asked in the Q&A um, about their uh, program, which focuses on um, sex ed, uh, that they're interested in assessment design and how to make it as best as we can be. What do we need to be demonstrating in order for funders and others to see our success and our impact, particularly in areas where, um, you know, the Sort of audience of funders broadly might be looking for different kinds of outputs and outcomes in the same space? Great question. Um, so I'm going to have to answer it uh, very, a little bit vaguely because I don't have all the specifics, but um, I do want to go back to uh, what a Annie mentioned just now in terms of outcomes. So outcomes have to do with the change that we think the services that we've delivered will yield in the population we're trying to serve. And they and those outcomes can be measured on different time scales. So you have, you know, short term, medium term, and long term slash kind of ultimate impact um, outcomes. And um there, there are programs that will never be able to really measure longer term impacts even though those are the ones that really matter because the program only touches or interacts with their clients on a very, uh, at, a, at a kind of very early stage in the process of like behavior change or, you know, um, change in circumstances. So when it comes to sex education, um, you know, there's this program is probably, probably has a goal of, um, preventing the spread of STIs, of preventing um, un unplanned pregnancies or uh, something like that. These are outcomes that we're going to see over years and at the population level. And so that particular program is not going to be able to, 
to uh, report on those outcomes. That being said, there are intermediary changes that should happen or kind of mediators that should happen on the way to those longer term changes. We can imagine that in order for someone to not get a sexually transmitted infection, they would have to know things, you know, know that syphilis is prevalent in our community, know how to protect themselves from that if they're um, engaged in activities where syphilis could be spread. Um, maybe have equipment in some cases, like, you know, prophylactic equipment to prevent um, the spread of the, the disease. And so there's a knowledge, there's like having things, and you can say to yourself, our intervention is to increase that awareness of the risk and knowledge of how to protect our, um, how to protect oneself and access to the prophylactic equipment. And we can deliver all of those things in our short-term intervention, the sex education class. But we also, but there are things then, then that we have to measure to verify that um, the population of interest actually had, uh, in, in, you know, increased their understanding so that they could make better choices in the future. And so at the time of the intervention, there should be a short-term outcome that is assessed that says, uh, that is about their understanding of, um, you know, the risk and how to protect themselves. Those things can be tested through kind of a pre and post um, survey design. And, you know, you should see, you know, fairly universal um, uptake, upticks in, in awareness and understanding. And then of course you can report on the distribution of protective equipment. Um, you know, we should all be a little bit unsatisfied with this framework because what we really care about is whether that correlates with the longer term outcome, which is relevant at a policy level of preventing the spread of STIs. That being, and, and you know, if we believe that the sex education is successful, we then might design a more sophisticated evaluation over time to test this in a more rigorous way. But you start with that, with the short-term outcomes, and as you see them, and as you build the population that's being served, you consider um, whether to invest in a, in a longer-term outcome, um, a longer-term evaluation. Yeah, that time scale can be so important, and I think that's where, you know, our, our discussions about mission and, and vision of an organization come into play. Like, do you have a mission that's really clearly tied to activities um, to what you're actually doing um, versus, you know, your vision is about the kind of world that we envision, right? Which a single organization by itself isn't, isn't going to achieve, but it's the world that we work together um, to get to. And so just really clearly delineating, you know, what, what time scale you're measuring and what you're working on mm -hmm. can help narrow that question down a little bit. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, on that uh, sort of on that topic, I have a question for Sammy. Um, so uh, one person in the audience is asking about uh, for direct service providers specifically, they're looking at high dosage versus low dosage programs. So for example, uh, a homeless shelter um, that does really intense, you know, we have X number of beds, we do wraparound services, we, you know, food and clothes and all that, but it's a lower number of people perhaps overall than a large umbrella organization or um, you know a convener might be able to go to the same funders and say, look, we touch you know this number of people across all of these programs. So how does a smaller organization that's maybe doing a fewer number of higher dose interventions tell the story um, about what they do and what impact that it has? This is this is a a core a core like I mean it's a comp, it's really complicated and Annie kind of started to answer it I think in the um in the chat there, um but yeah I mean it's a great call out you know there's there's a tension that happens there between depth and breadth um I think and so this is where outcomes are your friend outcomes are your friend outcomes are your friend <laughs> um and being able to measure really meaningfully what was the change that happened? Um, I, you know, there's something to be said about individuals served 
and reaching a large audience. And it's not to say that that's, you know, one is more important or one is less important because that's absolutely not the case. Um, they're really different. And so I think if you can, in your programs, look at what is that change to Nadine's point, you know, what's the time frame that you're looking at that change over? Is this, are we talking about a six month program, for example, I'm just throwing numbers out there. Are we measuring along the way so we can see outcomes and changes while they're in that program? Are we doing post evaluations that go long, you know, how far out into the future are we doing those evaluations of what the difference was when they were perhaps before, you know, prior to entering the program, during the program, and then now they've exited the program. Um, and then this is kind of throwing a little bit of a curveball in here, but I'm going to throw it out there is I think another piece that sometimes can seem either intimidating because it's how do you standardize to it or how do you bring this into your data is also looking at benchmarks. How are we performing above or below meaningful benchmarks, um, right? So the, just an example to kind of use um, in one of my previous roles, we we like to talk about the veterans kind of vertical because it's a really clean population that you can that is studied and has lots of research research behind it. And there's a lot of benchmarks there. But so you know, if you have an organization, or you have a program that is a six month rehabilitation for veterans, what is a comparative benchmark that is backed by research that you can show? Yes, maybe my program may not be reaching a hundred thousand individuals, but for the hundred individuals I'm reaching, look at how far above this benchmark we're performing because we're creating that really deep impact in these individual lives. And look at how far out those outcomes continue to carry past the end of their participation in our program. Um, yeah, happy to have anyone else jump in on thoughts because this is a, this is probably one that we could go for an hour on alone. <laughs> No, well, I guess I just want to reinforce how important the point that Sammy just made is, because, um, you know, sometimes we define impact in terms of improvement, and we aren't specific about what level, what degree of, of improvement is necessary in order to really change a trajectory for an individual. And I was thinking about this in relation to the question that Ashwina got about, you know, what if you're doing an educational intervention and you're you're dealing with kids who are in school, so the school is also basically delivering an educational intervention. That's where, you know, we have to be rigorous in our thinking because if we say our goal is to grow a child's, you know, math skills or literacy skills, they're going to grow anyway because they're in school, right? And so the, the question has to be, did we achieve, did we, you know, did we accelerate their growth to hitting an important milestone? Did they hit an important milestone? Are they reading at grade level? Are they more likely to pass an important test? Something like that, um, which, you know, is, is, is really compelling when you can demonstrate that kind of data. And I will also just say um, to, to the point about, you know, the size of the group that's being served, it's maybe it's not really as important as the the you know the impact that you're achieving to Sammy's point. And when you know that um, there's more that needs to be done for a population to you know if you're for example doing an early elementary intervention, and the real you know um, outcome that we're all concerned about is like high school graduation. Well, that happens a lot many years later. The question is not, do you continue to do more for that population, but can you describe who, how you make maybe a warm handoff to another organization that provides services mm -hmm. on that second or and third part of that um, chain? Yeah, I, this is such a fascinating problem, especially when we're talking about those outcomes, you know, years or decades out um, for different kinds of populations about what, you know, how do we describe our piece in contributing to that person's success in life and in different things. And that's, um, I just wanted to draw attention to a comment that, that Annie put in the chat that impact can be both a reach statement and output as well as a change statement and outcome. Um, we just have to be clear what conversation you're having with someone at the same time that both are important and that we need both when we're looking at program evaluation. Um, but it just depends on the context. I actually wanted to, um, I noticed that our panelists have been answering questions in the Q&A via typing, which is amazing. 
Um, Ashwina, you answered one in the question in the Q&A that I wondered if you would expand on just a little bit. The question was, how can individual organizations navigate getting data on control groups? And for example, working with school systems sometimes can be challenging to get access to really specific data. Um, but how do people think about getting access to that sort of broader research behind their work? I mean, thankfully for those folks working in Texas, Texas is pretty information rich um, coming out of the Texas Education Agency. And um, there is a, a significant amount of information there. And you can actually get um, data at the grade level by school um, directly from TEA and use that um, to create comparison groups. So if you don't have a comparison group that you can identify within a school or you can't um, work with the school district to have them pull a control group for you, then I am. Um, we have used in the past comparisons between um, your population uh, that you are serving versus schools that may look similar to the population that you're serving and identify really, you know, I completely agree with Sammy around, around the trend lines. Like, look at look for some trends. If the school district data or the the campus level data is growing at a particular rate or increased over time in a certain way, and your population that you serve has um, increased faster, um, that is something to point out. It, again, this is not about causation. It is all about correlation trending in, in the right direction, making sure you're selecting comparable students. So if you're serving um, uh, children experiencing poverty, then you can look specifically at the children experiencing poverty within school districts that, that may look like you and, and see how the change over time has taken place for those particular students in that demographic group versus the students in your demographic group. And Annie also added some uh, more information there. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. And I think uh, you know, we think about this in relation to education a lot, but I think all issue areas um, probably are similar that if you're looking at homelessness um, or, or unsheltered population of a city, looking at perhaps other cities that are similar in size and demographic, um, just finding um, groups that are comparative in whatever ways you can. Um, and it might not be, you know, your school district specifically, but that's the beauty of this kind of research that you can find comparative groups in other places that are still helpful in the information. Um, on the subject of doing research and participating in research, um, Ashwina and Annie, you both answered a question that I'd, I'd like to get on video just for our recording. Um, I have a support, this person asked, I have a supporter that keeps urging us to publish the findings of our work of our program evaluations. How long should data be collected and evaluated before it's worth sharing broadly? How much time or data are enough to be meaningful to draw a conclusion or suggest a correlation? And I think this, this is probably one of those it depends questions. Um, but Annie, if you would talk a little bit about, you know, how, how should organizations think about participating in research? Uh, yes, I'll just quickly reiterate. Um, I think that question was from Sarah. There's not a magical time frame. There can be really rapid studies that produce excellent evidence. There can be 30 year longitudinal studies. So it, it really just depends on the design, the methodology and the, the confidence and the findings. Um, Grace, I thought that this research question might come to me, so I'm prepared. Okay. I'm, gonna answer, I'm gonna answer the research question with two other R answers. Okay. One is rigor and one is randomization. <laughs> so, so under the header of rigor, we talk a lot with our partners about whether programs are ready for rigor. And that is not a value statement. Everybody's ready for something. Um, I'm going to quote Christina Hanger on that. She coined that phrase with me, ready for something. Um, so on the one hand, we might have... Um, pretty new programs that are just launching, they're iterating, they're designing, they're making lots of organic changes along the way. This is not the time to do a research study or some kind of really high stakes outcome evaluation. This is the time to be flexible, um, to do a little bit more light touch data, but still really focusing on what, what are we learning. Um, to Nadine's example, 
Are the people that we thought we were going to serve coming in the door? Yes or no? What do we need to do to adapt our program so that we can deliver those key activities that we think are going to drive the outcomes to the population that we are targeting? We talk a lot about feasibility and piloting in this, this stage of things. And unfortunately, this gets uh, jumped over pretty often. Um, you have to do a, a lot of steps, I think, to get ready for a truly rigorous study. Um, um, one of the things that we're consistently looking for when we're thinking about ready for rigor is uh, number one, is the program being delivered pretty consistently? Like, this is the real world, things change all the time, but for the most part, is there a real consistent cadence? If you're a mentoring program and you say you're gonna provide one mentoring session per month, are we getting about one a month, right? We don't wanna see zero and 25 and it's all different all over the place because that makes it really difficult to interpret um, outcomes. The other thing that we're looking for is uh, great data. So um, oftentimes, I think this goes back, I can't remember who got this question, but like where, where are the, the pitfalls? And I, I would say it's committing to a really high stakes, high rigor study too soon. Uh, sometimes organizations say they're gonna do that by the time they get to us and another evaluator, we have to back way up and say, okay, in order to do that, we're going to need this kind of data and that kind of data. And I, I see you all asking these, these questions in chat. Um, I'll stop there on the rigor because I could talk about that for probably three days. Uh, but I want to say just briefly about randomization. Don't be scared about randomization. People tend to think that that's like really fancy and like only happens in a research setting. But um, it can be simpler than you think. Um, imagine you have a hundred families uh, register or roster for some kind of program or activity that you are gonna provide and you have slots for 50 of them. You, rand you randomly pick then from your list of 100, you provide programming to 50 and you don't to the other 50. In, in the best world, you're doing some kind of wait list design where you ask that remaining 50, could we come to you next year and you can participate with us next year? And then you collect your data from both groups. That is challenging, but it's doable, especially if you're working on kind of light touch data. Um, that is That can be a really effective and sometimes relatively quick way to get some like higher confidence data um, about whether your program is is having those intended impacts. That's great. Andy, Any that's part? Okay, I'll stop Sorry. there. Yeah, <laughs> that's really uh, really actionable to think about. You know, where are the the things that we're doing now? The way that our programs are already. How can we think about randomizing where we can and just getting the pieces of data that we can get and just starting to build that sort of evaluation. Um, evaluation portfolio, I guess. Uh, in that, on that topic um, of deciding what to measure, so uh, one other question that um, was submitted was when organizational goals are about things like building relationships, having a sphere of influence, um, bringing perspective change, those kinds of qualitative um, qualitative outputs and outcomes, um, how, how do we most effectively share what our impact is? And this reminds me of a question we got during the, the program evaluation workshop actually about an organization that had participated um, and their organization was about um, sort of uh, what they called spiritual effects. So um, how connected someone felt to their community um, those kinds of intangible qualitative things. How do we how do we tell that story about what those impacts are, and how do we how do we begin measuring them? Um, and Sammy, I would love if you would start this question. Boy, uh, okay, <clears throat> <laughs> I was just like ruminating on this as I was reading the question. Yeah, um, I love Annie's point that all evaluation is storytelling. Like data is storytelling, right? Like it's all about how you use that data and how you convey what you find from that data 
the whole point of data is to either tell a story, make a decision, so convey something, right? Um, so this is maybe a little more like specific actionable what I'm thinking here, but um, to the point we've made multiple times is what's the change that happen is happening? So sure, maybe you're, what you're looking to see is, is there an increased awareness of X topic? How do you think about before my intervention, whatever that intervention may be, whether it's broad awareness, whether it's a direct intervention, what was the awareness of something vice after my intervention? What was the awareness? Is there an increase? Is there a change? Um, that's maybe very vague, but I think that's where I'd start from is how do you, how do you think about to Annie's initial point where, what are you trying to achieve? What is the end goal? And what are maybe some simple high, high touch questions you can ask that will help you understand, did I get to my end goal? Was I, was I even pointed in the right direction to the, no one showed up for the diet, you know, for the, for the diabetes, um, medicine, food is medicine, um, program. So that's kind of where I think I'd start is how, what question, what are simple questions I can ask to understand if I've made change. And then just remember, like, like we've said, all of this is, all of this is to tell a story. And then how do you leverage that story, right? How do you take it a step further and leverage it to say, yes, I'm making change or no, maybe I'm not making change, but now I'm going to pivot so I can make change. Yeah. That storytelling and, and conveying what, what your organization is doing in the world is so important. And I'm going to take just a second to plug our upcoming workshop in September will be about the form 990 which sounds random, but uh, it is connected that the 990 is really an amazing opportunity for organizations to share their story and to share their impact and to tell what their organization is doing in the world. So um, keep an eye out for the invitation for that workshop coming up after the summer. Uh, I have one more question for Ashwina, and it is kind of on this topic of, um, you know, deciding after we've decided what to collect and we've started collecting data, I, I think a common struggle that um, organizations run into is, okay, now I have this enormous Excel spreadsheet of all this data that we've collected. Um, you know, analytics is kind of a big scary word, but how do we start digging into that? And where do we go for help in thinking about how do we pull usable information out of these you know, out of all this information that we've now collected from our participants? Yeah, that's a great question. So when you have data, um, the first step is to get curious. And, and what I mean by that is to make sure that there's a particular question that's guiding how you're wanting to use the data or a particular result. So that could look like, um, let, let's do education because it's just where my head has been for 20 years years and, and I recognize that's not where everyone else's head is at, but let's say um, I really have all, I'm sitting on this education data and I want to know how third grade readers are doing, right? Um, and you've got attendance data, you've got demographic data, you've got actual results, you've got quarterly results of um, education assessment data. And you're like, goodness, what the heck do I do with this? It's a lot of information and it may be you know, 50, 60 kids, then, you know, at least 20 or 30 columns, right? And and kind of structuring a spreadsheet in a way that is a little bit easy. So so once you have your question and maybe your data is sitting in different places, I would say about 40% of the time in doing analysis is really about cleaning and getting the data right uh, to the place that you can analyze it. I see a lot of head nodding. That's probably some, sometimes it's 50 or 60, but, you know, we'll, we'll go 40 on, on the low end. Um, 40% of the time cleaning up your spreadsheet, getting it, uh, <laughs> getting your spreadsheet and, and the, and the data in a place where, where you can actually use it and make sense out of it. And if you are just starting off, um, my recommendation is to keep it simple and keeping it simple is using Excel. Like you don't have to build out a massive data system. You don't have to create um, a database. You don't have to do these complex things. Uh, your 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 best tools um, to merge different data sets will be a lovely thing called an X lookup, 
please YouTube that if you don't know how to do it. Um, and then also pivot tables, like start there. Um, and there's so much you can do with merging different data sets and um, constructing tables that will give you lots of insight into how your data um, is, is being, uh, it, it, what the results of, of your data are, or just answering some of the questions that you have. I'm going to pass it over to Sammy because I'm sure she's got lots to add to what I said. I, yeah, I'm, I'm laughing because arguing with data is 75% of what I do anymore. But uh, so yes, that all resonates a lot. But what I was, what I would continue on with that is um, to the point of keep it simple, right? From a very like specific, like actionable thing, use single column headers across your data sets, right? Make it really clean. So, you know, keep your metrics at least early on, keep them consistent, right? Are people answering yes, no, and that's it, right? Keep it, keep it really, really simple. The more simple and the cleaner your data is, the easier it is to draw those insights out of it. Um, and not to be the person who plugs again what they do, but I'm going to do it. This is literally what um, kind of one of the gaps in the market that, you know, our founder saw was people not knowing what to do with their data once they have it, right? They have really meaningful insights. They know it lives somewhere in this data. What do I do with it now? Um, and so that's kind of the genesis of what Upmetrics was, was how do we help impact producers take all of this information that they're collecting and ingesting and then use it as a tool they can leverage to better visualize and tell their story. Um, so that's the plug, I'll leave that there. But um, yeah, I mean, to Ashwina's point, just get curious and like, what are those driving questions? You know, what what type of change are you looking for? Are you looking at year over year change? Are you looking at just, did someone participate in this or did they not? Um, sorry, I get a little geek, geeked out about data as you can tell, the animation just came to life, um, but, yeah, keep it simple. I just wanted to reiterate that from the person who gets to dig into these data sheets, it will make your life easier. It will also make your your insights more meaningful. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sammy and Ashwina. I think that is a great place for us to stop. On that note, uh, we do, You, sh if you're an audience member, you should have seen a poll come up. This is our data collection. It's three questions. Uh, if you would like more on this topic, please go ahead and um, add that to the, that third question there about what else you'd like to see. We are in our first year of the Nonprofit Impact Institute here at SVP Dallas, and we want to know what you want. So um, please answer that before we drop off. And I think that's a great, a great place to stop. Thank you so much to our panelists for joining us today and sharing your expertise. I hope everyone got some answers to questions, to burning questions that they were looking for. Um, so I'll go ahead and stop the recording, but thank you all so much for being here with us.